Um, how do you teach someone how to innovate though? That's hard, bro. Like as soon as you said that, I was like, bro, Elon has not replaced Elon and Elon's job is innovate. Welcome to the Winning Move podcast. We have a great dude coming on again who has generated thousands of leads through SEO. My main man, Andy. How you doing, bro? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Awesome. Good talking shop beforehand. Um, yes. Thank you so much for coming on, dude. I met you at, what did I meet you at? Million Dollar Meeting? I think so. Yeah, down in Dallas. Yeah. Yeah, I met you down in Dallas. We connected pretty well. And then um, we've been, to, uh, we're in the family mastermind together. And so I want to bring you on and really help people learn how to do better with SEO. We had another company on that's somewhat similar, but I mean, the online traffic, it, I think is the best, right? Because I mean, all sure. lead generation is when you have a business, right? Like you can have cold calling, direct mail, PPC, SEO, but like you need to have all these things like to keep it well-rounded because if one of them falls out or stops performing for a little while, you need the other one to bring it in. And if you can set up your website, good to bring in like SEO leads. I have a friend out here who closes like four deals a year from his website because he worked on his SEO. That's awesome. Then, bro, that's free money. It's free money. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll add to that too. I mean, if you really segment out what an, a web lead is, there's like, there's really three, there's really two styles of web leads, but then there's like within that, there's a couple other styles as well. And I really like to break it down to interruption marketing versus um, like an active, like higher intent kind of marketing. So you have PPC and SEO, which is like someone's going on Google, they're searching for sell my house for cash, sell my house fast, et cetera. Those are really high intent leads, right? You got to call those within like 30 seconds to a minute. Otherwise they're probably going to the next person. And, and the yeah. best way I can relate that to you is like, imagine if you called someone, you're locked into your car, right? And like, you're just going down the list. You're calling whoever, whoever picks up first. That's the guy you're working with, right? And so it's pretty similar on the, on the uh, motivated seller side. And on the interruption marketing side, that's like Facebook ads, YouTube ads, Google display ads. Um, and there's a whole, you know, Tableau, a lineage of stuff over there. Um, and I, I would akin that more to like direct mail or like TV or radio, where it's like okay. someone is seeing the thing, they're clicking on the thing, and they're kind of determining whether or not they want to actually fill out the form, right? And that kind of lead is typically at an earlier stage in the process than someone who's actively seeking out what they're looking for, right? And so if you talk, we talk a lot about cash conversion cycle and stuff, like how yeah. fast you get your money back while you're, because in wholesaling, cash conversion cycle is everything, right? Um, well, it's also what's that lead conversion cycle too, because that feeds into the cash conversion cycle. And the lead conversion cycle for a Facebook lead, YouTube lead, anything in the interruption marketing space is longer than it is in the active marketing space like PPC and SEO. How long is it? Is it about the same as cold calling? I'd I don't have any experience with cold calling specifically. I'd imagine it's probably in that similar ballpark, but we typically see that 90 to 120 days area, the interruption yeah. marketing side. And then for the active marketing side, 30 days. I mean, it's, which to me is a huge gap, but also the price point for that PPC lead or just running PPC versus Facebook ads is going to be a lot higher. And then that's why you typically see more enterprise stock clients going towards the PPC side than the Facebook side. Oh yeah. I mean, cause cold calling, you're anywhere from three to six months. Um, but wow. like bare, bare minimum three, right? I mean, cause it's the yeah. ultimate interruption marketing. Oh, for right? sure. You're calling a stranger like, Hey bro, sell me your house. Like, okay, possibly. Yeah. I mean, I don't really like it. I haven't really thought about selling it, but yeah, I should probably sell it. And then they got to go talk to their aunt, go pray to Buddha. Then they got to go pray to Allah. <laughs> and then they got to talk to their wife and they're like, yeah, okay, I'm ready. Right. And so it's a long sure. nurturing process. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I would say whenever I talk to like enterprise soft clients, like there's always a mix of marketing that kind of feeds into their system, right? Because that cold calling lead, that direct mail lead, you can drive down the price so much farther than you can on the, the PPC or the SEO side at first, right? Especially on the SEO side at first, but it, you have to be able to, you have to be able to build your business in a way where you can sustain that kind of growth period, right? And what I've noticed is for people who are first starting or first getting into um, the real estate investing space, like, I find for me personally, like I would want to have access to leads that do the deals like as quickly as possible. So I can understand the process as quickly as possible versus trying to nurture a lead through the process. But that's just me, right? That's just my investing style. Everybody has a different process and stuff too. I think um, like at the beginning, like buying leads is a good idea. I mean, so door knocking, pre foreclosures in your market, I think is like one of the fastest ways to get a deal because there's a built-in timeline of like 30 to 60 days. For sure. Right. Like there's an actual timeline and we already know the motivation. So like that's another like instant way. Cold calling, I think, is good. It's going to take a while. But I agree with you. Right. Because like if they're already there, the hardest thing at the beginning is those people need to be, get used to talking to people on the phone. 
right? Because they they can just fuck it off. I talked to that about this with like Brian. I was like, yeah, bro. I mean, we could go spend a hundred thousand dollars a month, and we could send you all the leads in the world. But if you suck, you suck, bro. You know, like so we need to like get you some solid at bats first, and then ramp it up, and then we can feel confident not wasting you essentially not wasting your money because me sending Grant Cardone 100%. leads and me sending you leads are two different things. A thousand percent. And I think that's something really unique about the motivated seller space. And if I already go back all the way to the beginning, when I first started, I think the biggest mistake I made was actually starting the motivated seller space because you get so few swings at bat when you first, like, but if you have four hot leads in a month, that's a great month. Like when you're first starting, right? like four hot leads where you could have gone and right, closed the deal. Solid. But that's only four swings at bat, you know, versus if you're doing yeah. like gym sales, for example, you get eight to 10 swings at bat a day, you know, and, and it, those could be like hot appointments too. And so like, I think that's the biggest difficulty from my perspective in the motivated sales space when you're first getting started is like, you don't yep. get very many good swings at bats. And so you, you, you spend a lot of either time getting those good swings at bats because you're going from the perspective of, I don't want to spend any money. I want to spend my time or you're spending a lot of money at first PPL running ads, doing whatever yeah. you're going to do to kind of generate those leads and bring them in to save yourself some time. It's a tough, it's a really tough niche to get started in, I think, um, compared to some other sales-based niches. Exactly. Um, so how'd you get started then, bro? Did you, did you ever wholesale? Like yeah. So when we first started, we started at the beginning of, um, right at the beginning of COVID. Um, and okay. I was trying to kind of, well, it was like a little bit before that we we're trying to figure, I was trying to figure out how to quit my job and stuff. And then COVID happened really like opened up um, some more time because you don't have to commute anymore. Like I had a very white collar W2 kind of job. Software what developer. What was your job? Okay. Where were you software a software developer. developer at? How much money were you making? How, <laughs> so how was, much did you actually work? Great questions. Um, so I was a software developer for the Navy um, and I was a civilian. So I was not, a, not enlisted whatsoever, but we did go on ships. We did go underway uh, occasionally to do testing on the equipment that we were testing or uh, working with kind of thing. Um, how much we make shoot. Um, I was government, so I, I wasn't much, probably like 70, 70, something, something like that. Um, okay. and what's interesting about the government too, is they, they force you to take a pension. And so they'll take $400 out of your paycheck every two weeks to put towards a pension that you don't get to use if you kind of like lead the government type thing. Um, so right. it was like, like I would have the same like salary per se as like someone else who came out of college in the similar job space or whatever. And then like my like take home check would be significantly lower than what theirs was um, for reasons outside of my control, which like that yeah. always killed me. Um, and did I answer your other question too? Um, and ignore the chat. I'm just writing down questions I want to ask. Okay, um, sure. As far as how much did you actually work? Because I always hear about all these software developers working like three different fucking jobs. And work in like 20 hours a week. I would say I was a pretty dedicated government steward, um, especially towards the beginning and stuff. I was, I would definitely, I was definitely in the office a lot. And part of that was because, so Liz, uh, my girlfriend, spouse, however you want to phrase it, um, she lived in Vermont at the time as also a software developer. And so we spent a lot of time going back and forth. And so like in the government, you could leverage your time a little bit. So if you kind of crunched your 40 hours into four days, you could then take Friday off kind of thing. And so I would yeah. be at the office like four days straight, like gym, like run in the morning, go to the, go to work, gym at night, go home, sleep. And like my job is an hour each way kind of thing. And then I would just fly up on Friday. Um, it's been a week. So, it, you know, there was a lot of time involved there. I would say the farther I got to the quitting your job, I think they call it like quiet quitting now. Like I definitely yeah. started putting less and less effort in. Um, I still did my you know part, but it wasn't as, as, a uh, aggressive as it was in the earlier stages and kind of thing. But I think the motivation has changed too, right? It's like the first, yeah. like, when I first joined the W2, I was like, that's my, that's my, that's the path. Like you got to go do this thing. You got to be the best. And then you, you try to become the best and you get your $400 pay raise or whatever. And it's like, all right, cool. <laughs> we're going to switch up what we're doing. Um, and so to, to transition that to how we got started, um, I tried cold calling. I also tried I tried cold, uh, like texting, uh, text blasting, cold calling. I tried cold calling mortgage brokers for a, a, a good bit of time to try to get their like their dead leads, try to like seller finance them properties that then we could go find kind of thing to get money up front. Um, oh, so like act, okay. act like a middle broker kind of thing. Um, and I'm a technical guy. Like as you could probably tell, like I'm not a super salesy kind of guy. And so I never had, I, I didn't put enough time under the bar to become a really amazing salesperson in that space. And mm -hmm. so based on our background, kind of quickly realized that the technical side was probably more of a more of a better suited for us. And so then we went down the PPC route, got pretty good at that. Then went down the SEO route and just, we 
dove down the rabbit hole very hard there um, for, for a very long time and are still going into it. So that's kind of how we got started. Um, we just started using with carrot and stuff like that. And I remember, uh, if anybody remembers like Adrian, like I remember getting on the phone with him a couple of times and then like kind of taking what we saw everybody else was doing, kind of putting into one piece and then taking a lot of stuff that we were learning um, on the side as well and, and kind of putting that all together. So that's how we got started. And then, yeah, we were just doing deals in the DC area and then eventually kind of ramped it up into multiple markets and then eventually ramped it up to the national level. And we've stopped doing as many deals actively and we're kind of just focused on the lead selling side at this point. How long ago did you stop doing deals and what made you um, stop doing deals? Like you're like, oh, wow, this makes a lot of money. You know, I should probably focus on this <laughs> and I'm better at this too. Like, I mean, cause we always, you're, I know you're a big fan of Hormozy. I'm a massive 100%. fan of Hormozy, the Messiah. Yes. I'm such a big fan of Hormozy <laughs> and my girlfriend too. So she went and bought these Fairlife protein shakes. She was like, Alex Hormozy said, that these were good i was like well if the messiah says they're good they're good right and it'll it'll better our lives um where was i gonna go with that um so at what point do you're like oh wow like we are really good at this because like with call magicians i was like yeah we're doing it and then people just kept coming to me i was like yeah i can make a couple bucks and then like it just kept growing and growing i think once we started if we once we started building websites we just could dominate the market with about six months it's like that's pretty crazy and we just kind of start rinse and repeating kind of thing at that point it's like you would tell someone, Hey, you were generating like 60 leads a month in this market. And they'd be like, I've never seen 60 leads a month in my life. Like, how do you do that kind of thing? Right. And so like that, those kind of conversations spurred, like, I remember we went to, um, carrot has like kind of a small mastermind called carrot camp. Yeah. I do like once a year or whatever. And we, the first time we went there, like, that's where we first talked about what we were doing and some of like the tech we built behind it kind of thing. And like, it was pretty funny. Like I, I remember Trevor, Trevor will probably talk about this at some point, but like the room was like, Whoa, like, what are you doing? Kind of thing. Um, and so that was pretty cool. And that was eye opening in the sense of like what we thought we were doing was like normal. And then we came there and we realized that like nobody else was doing that. And so they were like, Oh, so we just have to scale this and like then things would get better kind of thing. So well, where'd you learn how to do the website stuff? Because if you're a software developer, that's not websites, backlinks. So, well, so it is because like Google's just a machine learning algorithm, right? And so it's like if you okay. understand machine learning, then you can just take what they're doing and just kind of like reverse engineer it to the best of your ability, right? And so it's like, now you're just trying to pick up on the new signals that they're pushing out and like how, like the big thing right now with Google is just entities. It's like this large entity graph and it's like how it shifts and molds over time. It's so every update, they just kind of shift and mold the entity graph. And so it's, we're just trying to map that constantly and then just reapply that. Um, do you have people mapping it or do you have to read and map it yourself? Like I, that's fascinating because it'd be hard to keep software. up and I've started list. Okay. Tell me about this. So we, we, we have some custom software that we use to like kind of map some stuff out. Um, Liz is at, the advantage of the software developer background that we have was like, yeah, we were able to like go in and be like, oh, well, all we have to do is just code this. Now we could just scale it up to like a 10 X model kind of thing. Um, so is it like AI software, essentially, like you've created your own machine learning software that like adapts to what's going on and it keeps learning. Or do you have to play with it a little bit? We don't, nothing we do is AI or machine learning. And, and most people who say they're doing AI or machine learning are like not actually doing AI or machine learning. It's usually just like baloney and they just call it that. And it's like um, a bot. Yeah, it's just a bot that's just like if, else, if, else, you know, down yeah. a thousand times, right? Um, but like all we're trying to do is map a machine learning algorithm. And so like, at, so like machine learning, imagine like different weights moving around constantly, right? As like things change. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden there's an update and the weights change completely, right? And so it's like, okay. all we need to do is run the script after that and say, okay, well, from the weights that we track, like which ones have changed? And then we take Ooh. that information that we have and we just go reapply, it, right? So it's like, take, rinse, reapply, take, rinse, reapply over and over and over again it's how not often, it's not sexy at all like it's it's very simple but it's like also very complex at the same time too how often is google changing shit i remember russell brunson talking about like the google slap like how yeah, so, long ago and he said it was wild so how often is google and facebook it changing stuff how much did the ios update like fuck up you guys and what you guys were doing too so we don't even touch facebook we don't okay. we don't even have it we don't even have a pic, we, like we have a pixel but we don't even use it right now um we literally strictly just do seo like 100% pure blood <laughs> SEO. That's it. Um, and, and, and we should probably change that. We should probably diversify a little bit and stuff, but we're, you know, we're working towards that. Um, the, there's definitely Google updates often, like the larger updates probably happen once every one to three months, but there's minor updates that happen probably every once every couple of weeks. Um, mm -hmm. But what we're looking for is the shift in our niche specifically, right? Cause like just because there's an update in the entertainment or gambling world doesn't mean there's an update oh. in real estate. And so like, we only do real estate. Like we have this very single focus 
Alex and Rosie, right? Single focus, very single focus as to what we're doing. And so um, as long as we kind of stick to that and like don't try to do too many things at once, it's made it a lot uh, simpler to scale on that side kind of thing. Um, so. Talk about, I remember you saying on the family mastermind, how like Bing is super underutilized. Yeah, a thousand percent. So Bing, <laughs> Bing is like, so if Google has about 90% of the search results of the US, Bing has the other 10%. And I would say the most motivated sellers are the ones using Bing. Um, they're typically the oldest. They have typically the least technologically sophisticated, which typically leads to a higher profit per deal. Margin, uh, yeah. Margin, yeah. yeah. It's it's terrible to say it like that, but that's typically what that's ends up happening. Um, yeah. And so like, every single one of our biggest deals have been from Bing, right? Like if it's a Bing lead, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yahoo, like any of those like three, they're really, really juicy. And they all use the Bing, the Bing search algorithm and stuff. But how do you um, do, oh, so DuckDuckGo uses Bing search al algorithm? Yeah, yeah. And so Bing, so like any work. any ad you run on Bing will run on DuckDuckGo and Yahoo and AOL, et cetera. So how does that, go? so DuckDuckGo essentially just doesn't show you ads. Like they don't track anything. It's incognito mode all the time, right? DuckDuckGo still has ads. I, I believe they still have ads because we're paying. Well, I, I believe they still have ads, but they're not um, targeted towards what your search history is. Past search history is. Yeah. So if you search for Selma House Fast, like you're going to get Selma House Fast ads, right? But like uh, you're not going to get whatever you were searching for yesterday ads, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and they're not like holding. So like Google like cookies you, right? Or they track you kind of thing. And they have like a user profile for you. And it's like wherever you go, phone, laptop, computer, desktop, whatever, they're going to track that information as you move around and stuff. And DuckDuckGo is not doing that. Um, that's the big difference. So from could I, from what I understand, um, airlines track you when you look for an airplane ticket. If I go on DuckDuckGo, does it not track me? Well, okay. So before, <laughs> well, what do you mean before? Like, what do you mean an airline tracks you? Like on Google Flights or on Yeah, on like AA. Google Flights. Um, Google flights. Like, let's say if you look for something and you go look again, like they now know that you're looking and they'll keep raising they the don't. prices. They, they don't? don't. No. Is that's that a fallacy? That's a huge fallacy. Okay. So before, okay. So before, before I were in the real estate space, I was very, like very, very heavy in the credit card and travel industry. That was like the okay. hustle before the hustle kind of thing. And like, so, okay. So like a long time ago, Back when I was like flying to from Vermont, like what we <laughs> what we do. So okay, uh, United overbooks ERJ one forty five by one seat, ERJ one seventy five by two seats, and then anything between one hundred and uh, three hundred seats they overbook by three seats, and anything I think it's or two hundred fifty seats, and anything above two hundred fifty seats is like they go up to nine, right? So like on their Singapore to Newark route, they go up like nine or eleven seats or whatever, but all the regional flights are between one and two, and so you can tell if you know how to look which seats are overbooked. And so if you just start booking the flights that are overbooked and then you show up and then you, you play the game and then you get your travel credit for taking the overbook because you didn't want to leave anyway. And then you get your two grand and then you keep doing that over and over again. So by the time I was done with Vermont, like we had like 10 grand in travel credit that we were still using to go up to Vermont and stuff. So I was getting paid to travel. Like that's- the, well, I'd, pay yeah. I'd pay for that course. Yeah. pay for that course. There's actually some really cool stuff you could do with flights too. Like not to get too tangent, but- um, well, I don't, yeah, probably should get too no, tangent, but bro, there's a lot of stuff. No, you can. <laughs> I want to hear about it. It's okay. I, I, I like talking to you because you're interested, right? And okay, same thing. So, Let's okay, so there's, there's, there's two, there's two big things in the flight industry that you can do. One that everybody's heard of is hidden cities, right? So you can like, if you want to book a flight to Dallas, but you actually booked a flight to Phoenix and you go through Dallas and you just get off the plane, but that flight was cheaper, right? Yep. Everybody's heard of that one. Okay, cool. Next one's married segments. Married segments only work on an American and they work on United. They stopped working on Delta about two and a half years ago, and then or two years ago, and then I think it still works on Frontier and JetBlue. And basically, what you're doing is you're splitting up the flights, uh, the flight segments themselves. So let's say you actually want to fly to Dallas, but you have a connection. You might fly. Uh, you let's say we're flying to Austin. It's easier mm -hmm. airport, right? So like Denver to Austin. That's like what the the typical search itinerary is. But instead of that, we're going to do Dal uh, uh, Denver to Dallas, Dallas to Austin on the same airline, right? As one yep. ticket. And that's going to change the flight prices because they're looking at fare buckets. There's like 10 to 15 fare buckets per airline. They started like, like United starts at N and then it goes up to Y for economy and then uh, Z for business, right? And so if you change how you search for the flights themselves, you can change which fare buckets you look at. And so that is what allows you to access the lower fare buckets effectively. It's called married segments. It's pretty right. cool. Like you could drop a flight price from like $900 down to $150 really quickly. 
It's, really? I'll show it to you. Yeah, I'll okay. show it to you later. But yeah, it's, it's very, very cool. Um, and we used to use that a lot. And you can combine that with Hidden Cities too. So you can do Hidden City plus a married segment, which means like, I've seen so many flights be like $1,000. Like, you know, those flights that are like, you're like really confused why this specific flight is so expensive. Uh -huh. It's like always one of those flights. And then you just add the Hidden City and the Marine segment. And then you're, you're off down to like 150 bucks a pop. What if I have a, so. so I have a direct from Fresno to Salt Lake. And that's probably the most common flight I'm on. And it's with Delta. How well, can I, would I try to do a hidden city. down? I would definitely do a hidden city then. Because you can't do married segments in Delta, but you can do hidden cities on Delta. And everything connects to Salt Lake city. city. Yeah. Oh, so hidden city would be like, I'm flying Fresno to Salt Lake City and Salt Lake City to Seattle. But I get off in Salt Lake City. So I just can't check a bag, but I use my mm. carry-on. And I just get the last leg kind of thing. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The other thing in the airline space is like fuel dumping. So you have like a $9,000 international flight, but then you dump the fuel on it. And there's fuel surcharges on this. We're getting, we're getting wild here. There's fuel surcharges on flights, right? So British Airways charges like 50% of their ticket price as a fuel surcharge. And so what you can do is you can, if, if you add on certain segments in certain ways, you can dump the fuel. So you can drop a price on a flight from like nine grand down to like 1500 bucks or 500 bucks for like a business class fare, for example. Bro. No, yeah. this is super valuable. I mean, most entrepreneurs listen to this, right? Entrepreneurs <laughs> are traveling. I think, I mean, I don't make you a lot yeah. of money in and of itself. Yeah. Um, okay. Most but, of that stuff, like the, the fuel search, the, the fuel dumping stuff you can't really find online and then the married segment stuff you can't really dump, find online. So people have a hard time finding that, but the, the hidden city stuff is like really easy to find. Like that stuff's like super publicized. Um, yeah. I probably should have just announced this on a podcast, but yeah. Anyway, we're good. Hell yeah, bro. I'm excited. <laughs> um, where'd you meet Kyle? Kyle, Kyle and I met um, over the phone. Um, Keith Sant introduced us uh, probably the beginning of the year. And then we were in San Diego at the time. I, I like talked to him for like a full week straight. And then we flew out to Denver to meet him. And that was it. Yeah. Just talked to him over the phone and met him in person. And for those um, of you guys who don't know, Kyle is Kyle, Kyle's your partner, right? Yeah, Kyle Bigger is a partner, and then Liz Hutz is a partner as well. And then Keith owns uh, the agency, um, and then there's a data company attached to it too as well. So there's like a couple of different pieces. So who's Liz? Liz is a uh, spouse, girlfriend, okay. that kind of thing. Um, and she is like, she's the core of it all. Like every, all information flows through Liz and so forth, um, which she's like a huge bottleneck in that way. So we're working on like uh -huh. sorting that out and stuff. Um, but super, super smart, but definitely a behind the scenes kind of person. Like she doesn't want to, She's kind of like Layla Hermosi, right? Like she's not the old Layla Hermosi where she wasn't trying to be the front of the company. Yeah. Um, Just in the back, to, getting shit yeah. done, running exactly. shit. Exactly. Yeah. So she crushes it. Like amazing, amazing person. Um, literally, we would all be running around with our heads chopped off without, yeah. <laughs> without her like whipping the whipping the stuff. So, yeah. Sweet, bro. So we got that. So you guys run an agency. Let's talk about the agency. Then I want to hear about that data company. Um, talk about why you partnered with Kyle. I think Kyle's crazy smart. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle's a Kyle's a dark horse. Like he's nobody knows about him, but he's a really, really smart guy. Um, and he's so so Kyle's background. I'll, I'll start with the data company first because Kyle's background's in data. Um, and for a long time, um, they've been doing data. They've been doing like enterprise level data, and they've been partnering with other data companies doing this, that, and the other. And they they kind of want to move into the retail data space to, to start actually selling uh, investors the the data that they have. And so they're the largest aggregator of pre probate, pre inheritance probate and widow data in the country by like a large margin that we know of unless someone was doing this secretly that's not publicizing it. Um, and so that's like really cool in of itself, right? Because that means they have access yeah. to the, pretty much the most amount of information of anybody. So they can make the highest, they, they have pretty much the highest accuracy right across the board and they have the highest level of data tabulation that they can have. So like they can understand what the scope of everything looks like so they can get the, you know, the best contract. And I'm not a data guy, right? They get the best contracts, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not a data guy though. It's so like, that's just my understanding of it. Um, yeah. And then property leads is like, that's the PPL company. So that's just straight, like we're just selling leads. Um, we do do a couple of partnerships here or there, some rev shares, that kind of stuff, but it's more or less just strictly selling leads. And then the agency is strictly SEO for real estate investors. So that's just like, how do we get as many real estate investors as possible who want to rank in the top three in Google? How do we get them to that place, right? And What's interesting is the biggest complaint we hear from, not complaint, but the biggest like feedback we hear is like, oh, well, like, aren't you competing with yourself because like property leads is SEO and estimates REI is SEO. And in one way that's true, but it's like, we can all win together because they're going to fill out three forms regardless, right? Pretty much always. And so it's like, as long as it's our clients and us who are getting the three form fill, it's like, I'm happy. 
right? Because like yeah. I'm just selling the lead. Like I'm not actually doing the deal and competing with you. Like it's up to like I'm gonna help you get the lead, but now it's on you to actually go there and close that deal and have an amazing sales process and follow up process and stuff. Yep. Same thing with cold calling. Like you just you have a list, but it's like everybody in the world can call that list. Exactly, bro. Everybody's calling follow. the list. Yeah, like it doesn't. You can say like I'm not. I won't want to compete with you, like bro. You're competing with 300 other people like right now as we speak. Like I, I'm not doing anything. Yeah, a thousand percent. What's it like um, working with your wife, dude? Dude, it, it's uh, it's it's unique. It's a unique challenge. I mean, it's a it, man. It's it's amazing in the sense that like it's mo- how do I say this? Like most people uh, spend as much time with their wives in like 50 years as I've spent with Liz in the past like three years or five years, Same. right? So it's like, I love that side of it, right? I, we like, we're literally living our entire lives together, which is really, really cool. The flip side is that like, you don't have that safe space to go to when something in the business happens. It's like, you're in bed, it's 9 p.m. And it's like, what do you think about business? What is she thinking about business? It's like, you never get that kind of downtime. And so I think the big thing for us has been trying to find like other outlets for that kind of yeah. non-business space. Um, and I, she's done a really good job of that. I have that really hard time with that because like, this is my life. This is my hobby. This Same. is my business. Like I don't yeah. do anything else and I love it. Like I have no regrets. Um, but because of that, sometimes like you miss yeah. that space and stuff. Um, and, and what's interesting too, is like one of, uh, one of my best friends that I've spent a lot of time with, like we're bringing him into the business because he's like a really, really smart guy. And like, he's going to help us solve a lot of problems that we have right now. And like, that's just another person that like, that was a safe space. Now he's in the business and it's like, ah, you know, um, so that's just an evolving, an evolving challenge, you know, and I'm sure you've dealt with the same thing in a lot of different ways. It sounds like, so. Oh yeah, bro. I mean, it, everything you said is like, yeah. I mean, cause it's yeah. bro, it's my hobby. Like I don't want to yeah. stop. Like nothing's yeah. ever going to stop. I mean, what, what would it say my hobby is? So I replaced social media recently with reading like manga comics. And so oh, I've awesome. been reading like One Punch Man lately. Okay. Right? But like besides that, like I don't have any hobbies. I'll go to Utah and like I'll snowboard, but I'll snowboard yeah. for three hours and I'll probably be on the phone half the time. You know? <laughs> yeah, if you want to come skiing out here, we can we can just talk business the whole time and just ski down the mountain. So bro, yeah. come out to Salt Lake, come to Brighton with me. <laughs> I'll be I'm I'm gonna get there on the 16th and I'll be there till like the beginning of January. Awesome. Come out, bro. Let's hit the slopes. Talk some you're business. You're snowboarding for two weeks straight. Yeah, I live up there. Awesome, that's crazy. Yeah, so like, we bought a pass, and so like, we'll just be able to go. Awesome, as much as possible. I love Brighton. It's a cool mountain. Brighton's dope. Um, yeah. Working with your wife, airplane, Kyle, AI. What's your goal overall with the company? Um, well, on the SEO space, we want to make sure that we're the only person getting paid if they want to play in the SEO space, um, which is a pretty, it's a pretty aggressive goal, but. Um, I, I feel confident that we have the ability to do it. Um, and I think we're one of the very select few people in the industry who have the ability to do it. So I'm, I'm, that's, that's the goal on the SEO side. And on the data side, it's just kind of to integrate because like online marketing can only get you so far. There's a limited number of leads in the U S that occur in every single day, regardless of how much you like press. On Why it, is right? that? Does Google legitimately throttle it? No, it's just, there's, there's so based on our data, which we could be wrong, but based on our data, we see about 10 to 20 leads per million people per month in the U S right. And so that is pretty much across the board. Uh, the places where that's not true, like New York city, Puerto Rico, um, and then Hawaii and Alaska are like a little more unique as well. But besides those places, like that's very standard across the board. And so you can't like, you can't force people to fill a form out of Google. You can't get like force people to search something on Google. Yeah. And so, um, until that happens, which is never going to happen, like you need other data sources that are more, more limitless, I think is probably the best way to put it. And so like, there's a lot of data out there that you can use. And data is kind of like, once you're like, how do I say this? There's three types of investors, in my opinion. There's like the investor who's getting into it. There's the investor who's like, they're a solo operator and they're crushing it. Um, and they're, they're kind of deciding what they want to do. They want to stay a solo operator. They want to move up to the enterprise level. And there's no wrong answer there. And then there's the enterprise investor and they're doing like crazy marketing, like just spending a lot of money and doing a lot of deals. And they also have very they have more thin margins. And so it's like a very, it's more of a, a slower move machine, but they have a lot more control of the situation, right? And that data portion, like as we see the evolution of the investors in our product line, it's like, okay, the first investor comes in, that new investor, property leads is a great entry product for them, right? You can't fail as long as you can do sales with property leads, right? 
mid tier SEO, right? Like you have the SEO coming in, they're putting more money into it. They're going to build their own brand, their own asset and stuff like that. Amazing for a solo operator, right? And then Levine is this, it's a very, very high ticket product, but it's amazing, amazing, amazing for enterprise or even high end solo operators. I mean, that's a 50K product typically or 20 to 50K product. And it's like with that product though, you could easily make $2 million, right? But yeah. it's like, you can't make that kind of investment when you're a new beginner or a, you know, maybe even the solar operator phase. Um, so that's kind of the evolution. And they kind of just like bolting things on as they come along. Um, we're definitely looking at uh, other ways to tap into the data that we already have kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And like how to use that for the marketing. Because right now we're just providing the data, but we can't actually provide, we can only provide strong referrals for the data itself. If that, mean, if that makes any sense, like for the marketing of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like the next piece. But we have to sort out everything else too. Cause like, it's a business, right? It's like, there's always all these other problems and you gotta be able to scale the first business before you can actually move on to the next five, right? Oh yeah. But what's been the hardest skill for you to learn over the last two years? <sighs> hardest skill. Um, it's, it's probably the one I still haven't mastered, which is public speaking and um, uh, kind of getting out there and talking to more people. Like we've been so in the weeds and just product focus for such a long time that like it was just never in the cards yeah. for us and like i i'm i'm terrible at it I'm, I'm not terrible at it but i'm i'm not i have a lot of room to improve right um and so that's like the biggest skill that i still need to work on today and i think it's the one that probably worked on the most which it might not seem like that but it's i've worked on that a lot um, oh, but you're doing great thanks Chad. Um, <laughs> when did you so do you sell for your company or to someone else like when did you learn how to sell if you are the one selling and how did you do it? Um, so I was I was doing it at first, and I, I, I thought it went fine. I thought it went good. Um, <laughs> but uh, we so we have a person called James now, um, and they do most of the customer interfacing. They do pretty much all the customer interfacing stuff, except for like the strategic relationship type stuff. It's yep. like a higher level. Um, and so I think we were able to train through that process pretty well. Um, I definitely would say like if someone asked me like, hey, can you train a cold calling team? I would say no, I cannot train a cold calling team. Right. Can, you know, like, can you, can you like manage a sales floor? No, I can absolutely not manage a sales floor. Right. So I know my, I know my limits, yeah. but I also understand, like, I know the process, like if I, if I were to buy leads, like I can walk myself through that process and understand what I would need to hear and how I would need to hear it and what I actually need in the product to, to be successful and to, to feel like I'm getting a, a good deal kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. No, that answers the question, bro. Um, so align your roles in the so let's just say in the leads company what are the roles that you're doing what are the bottlenecks that you're actually facing that are like stopping you from getting to let's say 20 million dollars a year so the the first bottleneck is is the person we're bringing on right now and that's tom and um liz is a huge bottleneck of information right now so she does a lot of the development stuff and so taking some of the development stuff off of her plate and giving it to him it's gonna be huge and then the second piece is like i'm kind of the center of the seo information for the company and so it's like teaching like so keith at the agency he knows a lot of stuff but he's focused on like building agency instead of driving forward like seo innovation kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and so teaching something every teaching someone everyone everything i know about seo everything i know about seo and then like teaching them how best i've seen to innovate on the seo side and having them try to drive the innovation instead of me driving the innovation will free up like that'll free up between liz and i like 40 hours a week like and that's to me that's a lot of time how do you teach someone how to innovate though? That's hard, bro. Like as soon as you said that, I was like, bro, Elon has not replaced Elon and Elon's job is innovate. That hundred percent true. And I think uh, the first piece is that, like, I'm not a smart guy. Like I'm not the smartest guy in the room pretty much ever. And the person that we're hiring is way smart, way smarter than I am. Like I'm both a uh-huh. IQ level, just like across the board. Right. They just don't know anything that they're talking about when it comes to SEO um, or like the ins and outs of our business specifically. Right. And okay. so like you can't, I, I believe that like if I give him all the information that I have, then like he can make mm-hmm. better decisions than I can make. Right. It's just going to take time to give him all the information that I have right now. 100%. And so that's like the big transition and it's not going to be fast. Like it's going to take a year at least I imagine. Um, and probably a year, like part of that time, just be working together, solving the problems together, et cetera. So, so what was your interview process like that? Cause I find it, I have a rule. I won't work with family yeah. or friends cause I'm a cunt. You know what I'm, <laughs> Me too. Like, 
right? I mean, I have like a really yeah. high standard. I'm like, bro, what the fuck's going on? Like, this is what we do. Like, I love you, but there's a standard and the standard needs to be met. If you can't meet it, no hard feelings, but like we have to find someone who can because the collective is what matters. Yeah. Um, I think I knew the person, there was like a very specific type of person that we needed for this role. And the person needed two things. They needed to A, be way smarter than, way smarter than me. And uh, B, um, they needed to, that's the best way to say this. They needed to want to be an entrepreneur, but they didn't have either like the guts or they didn't have like the preference to leave their job and go out on the loan. Yep. And that person, I think, is the kind of person who's going to not only be able to like drive the company forward on their own because now they've, they've, they've been given the box and they just need to know how to grow the box, right? And like yep. growing, the bo- growing the box is easy if you care about that kind of thing. Um, it's a lot harder to create the box. And so this person that we knew, like, they, they just fit that role really, really well. Um, so it, it wasn't much of an interview process, if that makes sense. We just kind of knew we, there was like a very select few people who could fit that role. Um, and I think this is one of those kind of people. So. so what type of media and books are you consuming to learn more? <sighs> um, <laughs> that's a good question. Media and books. I listen to Alex Mosey podcast pretty actively. Um, and then uh, I've stopped listening to pretty much any real estate investor podcast um, because there's just, it's, it's not because that they're bad. It's just that a lot of them are like very pitchy and, and a lot of them are shiny objects. Like, Oh, here's how you very do true. lease options. Yeah. Lease here's options. how you do innovations. Like, here's how you own, own a finance. Hey, guess what? Here's how you can wholesale commercial notes and make $10 million. Like there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And which is amazing for someone who's new potentially. And like, they want to figure out what they might like kind of thing, but where we're at, like that just doesn't vibe anymore. Um, I would say the Alex Mosey podcast is probably, and, and the Layla Hermosi podcast are probably like, or Layla has channel. one? She has a YouTube oh. channel. Her YouTube channel is fire, bro. Yeah, it's really good. Especially for like managing people and like trying to figure out that, the, the actual process of the business instead of just yeah. like the numbers of the business. She crushes it like really, really well. Um, those are probably the big, the big two. I mean, I'm so focused still on the product side, right? Like we're so focused on the product side still just because it's like, we're in that execution phase where we have to keep growing it and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I'm still focused on just like networking with people within those kind of communities and talking to them rather than listening to mass media. Not that that's bad at all, but it's like, that's, that's just where I'm exactly. at right now. Um, yeah. So it's been busy. <laughs> Cause I, I got listened to a podcast called my first million. Okay. Um, the knowledge project. You'll love that one, bro. You'll love the knowledge okay. project. Okay. Um, he just had on the, former CEO of Boeing who went over to Ford when Ford lost $16 billion in a year and he turned Ford around. Is it my first million and the knowledge project, right? My first million, the knowledge project. Okay. And then what am I, do you read any books? No, I'm not a book guy. Really? Yeah. Um, What I found is that the, the best books are distilled down. So for example, like yeah. Alex Mosey is like, he's read all these books. Well, I know for a fact he's taken everything that was cool in those books and he's put it up on his podcast, Yeah, which is amazing. It means I don't have to read the books. And like, I, I'm sure there are things, I'm sure it's 80-20, right? Like I'm sure there are things I'm missing in the books. And I think if there were books I was going to read, it'd probably be like everything that Russell Brunson world where it's like um, yep. Frank, uh, not Frank Kern, um, uh, Dan, uh, I just can't remember his name right now, but the, like that world, Dan right? Dan Kennedy. Yeah. Dan Kennedy. Yeah. Um, but I'm not at the phase of the business where we need to focus on that kind of marketing yet. Um, like everything in properties is pretty much growing more or less by referral and organically. So it's like, we haven't kind of focused on pushing out the message if that makes sense. When do you think you guys will turn on ads? Cause that's a whole nother monster. That's one thing I've learned is that like, you have to master so many different skills so fast and like what you're doing to actually like make it grow and like hit the numbers you want. I'm hoping that we'll never have to turn on ads. That's That's my goal. And I think if we can, if we can be successful in the next three months, I truly believe we will never have to turn on ads. So in the next three months, what do you mean by be successful? Like just create an absolutely killer product, right? But we're never going to have to run ads. I think the product itself. So I'll tell you that I'll tell you super transparency, like our two biggest complaints yeah. across the board. Um, we're not getting enough leads 
and um, shoot, we're not getting enough leads. And then the other one is like, it was like, uh, we're getting too many MLS listed leads, which we refund anyway, right? And we're yeah. having a software solution to that now in the next couple of days. But the big one is like, I'm not getting enough leads, right? And man, of all the complaints to ever have in the world, like I'm not on a PPL model, like I'm not getting enough leads is an amazing thing to have, right? That really and these is. people who are already getting 10 leads a month. So it's like, yo, like we're, there's something good here happening. Um, and every time I turn around, it's like, we're getting messaged on like the investor field stage without us paying anybody to talk about us, right? Or like, we're getting, um, like people are talking about us behind our back and things are positive. Like I haven't heard many negative things. And I'm actively seeking out the negative stuff. And so like, that to me is a really good sign. And so it's like, if we can just keep driving that forward for the next couple of months, like, I don't know what, I haven't read many organic growth books, but I imagine it's like one person talks to two, two person talks to four, four to eight, et cetera. And it's like, and it's those last like couple of months where that's happening, where it really starts to explode. People start to really know what's going on. Um, so that's my hope. Um, what is it? So the next thing I would say is like, Yes, word of mouth is amazing, but when we create an amazing blue ocean product that's awesome, margins will eventually get shrunk by the competitors who see the blue ocean. So I don't know if you guys have thought that far, because like generally, like you don't come across very many people who have this unique of a business, right? To like, no, bro, I, I think it's dope, it's killer, but eventually competitors come. Yeah, I would say so. On the data side, they're probably three years out from copying it, and then okay, um, I don't. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if anybody is going to be willing to put in enough time and effort to do what we're doing on the SEO side. Oh, fucking be super awesome. transparent. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Like, and if, if someone's going to do it, like there are other people in the space who are generating lots of leads, like in the hundreds. I don't think any one company has generated more than a thousand in a single month. Um, and that we're, you know, past that and stuff. So it's like, I think we're, I think we're pretty far, far beyond that kind of stuff. And there's a huge, huge, huge financial investment that goes into doing that kind of stuff on yeah. the front end to actually be able to see the back end profit and stuff. And so you're not going to see like an individual person do it. It'd have to be someone with a lot of money mm -hmm. and a lot of know-how. And it's not going to be someone with an SEO agency. It's going to be someone who's you're going to dedicate the next three or four years of their life just to doing this one thing. Um, oh yeah. So I think um, there might be better yeah. places to make money if they're going to go do that. Right. I mean, cause you guys are going hard. Uh, I'm trying to think about any other questions, bro. I don't think I do. Um, what would you like to leave everybody with? Best way to reach out to you. Best way to find, best way to yeah, find your company. Yeah. Message me on Facebook. If you want to talk, I'm always open to talking about SEO or business or, or whatever. Um, Propertyleads.com. If you want to buy leads, um, small pitch. Um, SME sorry, is the agency and then lead is the data company. Um, and then the, the piece that I would leave, piece that I would leave people with, Interesting. Um, we've been told so many times that we can't do what we're doing between like friends, family, et cetera. And then like, you know, people in the business world, like people stole money from us, et cetera. Right. And so it's like the Alex was in pockets on the other way, like the other day, like on the, the dark side, like focusing on your dark side and stuff. And oh, I think huge. for huge, yeah, like massive. Like I, I probably am not, um, in the right phase of mindset to grow like from $10 million to a hundred million dollars. But like, I can tell you right now, that like I'm very confident that we're in the right phase of mindset to grow from where we're at now to, to the next phase and stuff. So. Are you I'm, a big fan of Tim Grover? Tim Grover. I don't know that name. I'll Bro, okay. Up. So look, read the book relentless. I promise you'll love it. Okay. Get Check it on it audiobook to where he talks about the dark side of being like a high achiever. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's what it's all about. It talks about like Michael Jordan's like massive gambling problem and Michael Jordan going hard. Like every um, everyone has a, every successful person I know has a massive dark side. Like you have to yeah. like channel it. Eventually, you'll get to a point where you have to be different. But for a while, bro, you have to be able to channel that. Yeah, yeah. There was a there was a quote the other day I saw that was like to master like it was it, something related to um, it's like Taoism or something where it's like you, mm -hmm. you give up all material items or something like that. And it's like, you have to master materialism before you can master Taoism. And so I see the same thing with the dark, the dark side, right. Where it's like, you have to master the dark side before you can move on to the light or whatever it might be. Like if you just go to the light, then you yeah. miss the entire piece that gets you to that part. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's pretty powerful, at least for me. Like I'm dark, man. Like, <laughs> man, like I, the drivers behind me, man, like it's super, 
super negative stuff probably um which maybe that's normal maybe that's not i'm not sure i think it's the best thing ever i mean it, i'm the same exact way and so i resonate it we resonate with it a lot some people don't think like it is the craziest thing to me because like i remember everything and i will bury yeah. all of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> i remember stuff yeah yeah, the people that um and, and that's that's something very unique about the real estate space. So people typically stay in people who are in the real estate space for more than a couple of years typically, it seems like they typically stay in the real estate space for, for a good period of time. And so um memory definitely serves you well. And and something that I realized is it's very important to have a neutral or positive reputation with everybody you meet. Um yes. and to not have a negative one. And I think I'm still there with the with the non-negative, um, you know, more or less, but it's it's critical, man. Because like someone will eventually ask the next person, like, "Oh, what do you think of Andy?" Right? And it's like if that you, they get back to you with a negative thing, then it could ruin the I business will, relationship. So, I will have a negative if I combat someone about them do, like doing some stupid shit. But I will never, I don't ever want to have a negative on doing something someone dirty. Like I will have a negative on like, no, these are my morals and these are my values, and I did not fuck yeah. with what you did. And so I addressed it, right? Like I'll 100% take that. But as far as like morals, values, doing some, doing someone wrong, anything like that, to me, never. I mean, because yeah. again, like that, um, bro, and this is a fucking damn near Hermosi, um, what's the word? We are referring to Hermosi a lot. He should pay us some money. Yes. Um, <laughs> brand is forever. Like brand is infinite. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, I actually have a question for you before we get off, but like, I've noticed that you, I didn't know that you had grown a personal brand and stuff. And so something that we've been talking about recently is like, do we need to have a personal brand to do what we want to do? And well, I'm going to, I'm going to say the statement. I mean, I want to hear your feedback on the statement kind of thing. And that you don't, you don't need to have a personal brand to do really, really well and to crush it in life and to be whatever. Right. But having that personal brand will make it a faster result and make it more effective. Yes. What do you think about I, that statement? I think having a personal brand, I'm 100 on board with like um, again Hormozzi. He's like, bro, it's the new oil. Because I get, I personally am competing with Alex, Ryan Pineda, and fucking Budweiser. Right? Like I, I'm competing with them for all the attention in the world. Because if I have all the attention in the world, I can sell and market whatever I want. And if I really wanted to, I could fucking drop ship it all and be a billionaire. You know what I'm saying? To where like if I, I don't have to have any operations, I don't need to have anything. I could just push products and be the ultimate affiliate marketer and just vet them out and then push it. And that still gives me a ton. Like we grew call magicians um, through word of mouth and then my social media. We still haven't run ads. Really? Yeah. Like we've, um, we've tested them out and I think I spent like $1,000. Like, fuck it, bro. I don't want to do this. Right. And then the market started to turn. I talked to one of my mentors. He's like, bro, fucking get better at brand. He was like, just keep growing it. How much time per week do you put into the personal brand? This will go into brand. Um, also go into brand. Now it's going to be a lot more. So me, I don't know if you met Dean Rogers, but me, Dean, and have you met Jason Pritchard? He's in Fuel. I, I don't think so. So me, no. Dean, and Jason are pretty much going on tour across America. Okay. All for like personal brand. Um, like going and speaking at different meetups. I would say it's a third of what I do think about. Like I was walking around and like thinking of new taglines and it just like kind of happened. So I'm like, yeah, this would be a good tagline. Um, one I'm thinking of is like three things I'd ask um, from Santa for Christmas as an entrepreneur. Right. And so like, that's a really good tagline that'll get people's attention. And it's like, well, what, what would one thing be? Like I would want to be able to take in more inf information and implement it faster. Right. So like, that'd be one thing I'd want from Santa Claus. Right. The ability to handle more stress than anybody else because that would serve me very well like i could put myself in very uncomfortable situations like whatever that is i'm like thought through what the things i'd want that's a good tagline i can go do that it'll get viral right if i can make it viral and then i can go out i can raise more money i can push whatever product i want right it's really really easy right because now all i had to do is post on my social media that we're buying another facility well a facility and then i had like six people hit me up like hey like send me info send me info send me info to where that'll make it easy for me to go out and raise cash. And I think the person who's doing this the best and who I like personally admire as an entrepreneur, as a man, as a human, is Pace. Like if you follow what 
Pace Morby does. Pace will be a billionaire within 10 years, no questions asked. Legitimately from, he could do it through raising money, just through his social media. Right, because now his brand is so big. He has so many people following him, so many people in his education space. And he, like, he raised like $60 million, bro, inside really? his coaching group. Wow, that's crazy. Right, I mean, that, bro, that's a crazy amount of cash. And that all comes from brand. What else? Um, him and Jamil pushed this company called Privy for doing like on market marketing. Yeah. And essentially, and I was talking to Jamil about it, I was like, bro, why don't you take equity? He's like, yeah, I just don't want to do it. But they, I would not be surprised if they 10x their business. And so if I can go out, I can talk about a software company, right? And I can go and be like, hey, and essentially what Alex Ramosi does, like now Alex has enough brand to be a billionaire for not even investing money in the majority of these companies. He just says like, yeah, we'll advise you and we want a 30% equity split. You know, like there's so many different ways I can put it to where as long as I have like the control of the eyeballs, I can maneuver it so many different ways around do my own stuff, push other things to where I think it is absolutely massive. That's why I'm doing this podcast because it'll just go more into personal brand. But I think it's like the biggest thing you could do as an entrepreneur. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. What's the, what would be the biggest piece of advice you would give to someone who's trying to grow their personal brand? Be real. Let's post about what you're doing. Yeah. And provide, I mean, you want to provide value and entertain. How, how niche specific were you when you first started? Were you focused on like, here's what I'm doing within call magicians? Or was it like, here's what I'm doing as an entrepreneur? Um, I probably need to niche down more because I don't even make call magicians content, bro. Like we started making some, but like it's um, entrepreneurship stuff. And then I'm in the real estate space. So people follow me for that. And then I can push stuff with that. At the beginning, I didn't want to bottleneck myself with call magicians. And I got this from like my mentor. And he was like, bro, nobody knows what companies I own. He was like, and I make eight figures a year. And so I kind of took that approach to where he has an amazing brand and he uses his brand to make money. But his products and businesses that are the biggest, honestly, are not in the space that he's like in, if that makes sense. Like he's like has a business that makes him a ton of money in the B2B space but it has nothing to do with his audience. And so I took that approach to where now like I'll lean back into it, make cold calling stuff, and that'll help call magicians grow more. And, I, and we've talked about this, bro. I, I have fucking, what do we have? Storage, call magicians, our wholesale company, our mastermind. We have like four things going on to where you can only push so much at the same time. So I'm like, okay, what's the best way for me to like grow these things all at the same time? It's probably just talk about entrepreneurship and then deals that we're doing and then deal breakdowns. Right. And then because if someone's yeah. watching me do a like, so I have like a whiteboard over there, like, hey, all right, I'm going to do a deal breakdown of how we're buying the storage facility. I'm going to make twenty thousand dollars when I buy it. Right. So people who are in the real estate space will still watch that. And then they'll dive deep into my rabbit hole, see what else I'm offering, see what else I can sell. But sorry to get back to your question, what I got started doing is I just um, started doing quotes of the day. Hmm. So if you scroll back to like the very beginning of like when I decided, I remember like telling Steve Trang, I was like, Steve, I'm gonna be a fucking guru, bro. I'm going all in. And I was like, I'm gonna be a guru. And so I started doing quotes of the day just from like books. And I remember like my first one, I was like, there's a lot of things I care about. And one of the biggest things is how do I make other people feel about themselves when they're done talking to me? Right. And so, and so I was like, and that was a quote and I just elaborated on it and I put it out. And then I started going on walks with my son and I just post about whatever I read that day. I was like, hey, so quote of the day, this is what I read. Thought this was powerful. Elaborate on it for like 30 seconds to like a couple minutes and then put it out. But I just wanted to get used to it and like put out valuable content to where now it's taglines have become huge just because of TikTok and TikTok is so powerful. Are you on TikTok? Yes, but it, I need to be more taggy. I was talking, um, his name's Austin Rutherford. He's gone like insanely viral twice like insanely viral um, for posting about like the amount of units him and other people own. Troy has been like mentioned on the wall street journal viral Interesting. Um, with millions of views to where TikTok is the biggest focus, but that one, this content doesn't work quite as well on TikTok. Like I have to like sit down and like come up with like taglines because I have to catch their attention in the first 30 seconds. But for you, bro, I'd say put out content that is applicable to your business. And then educate and entertain because, I mean, most 
most people are like, bro, I love you because of your style, the way you are with your kid, and I think you're funny because I just talk shit on social media, right? And post about how fucking stupid Biden is, or I post like this old Vietnamese dude who I play basketball with who's named Dao. His, I call him Dao the Menace. He just fouls everybody. He's like five foot two, but he fucks shit up, right? Whatever it is, I post about it, right? And to where that way I want to be in front of people all the time, and I want them to think of me just when they think of like business or real estate. How different is a Facebook group than a brand? Facebook groups are still powerful. Um, we're building some, but again, it goes into that. I guess I could work more, but like I'm not the operator type, right? Like I'm more like the visionary to where I'm not very technical. Like I'm more low-key salesy and like just visionary, new ideas, and then I need someone to help me implement it. Because like with that, growing that Facebook group is really good. And another example, a dude I know who owns a VA company sells probably like 100 people a month out of his Facebook group. Who are like, that is massive. I mean, the recurring revenue on that, even the upfront revenue on that is, um, I mean, it's like 100 grand, 100 something grand. If, like you just like do the math and that's just startup fees. And then you implement the recurring revenue off of that. That's pretty crazy. And it's all free. Yeah. But that does that, I wouldn't say, the way I would do that and the way my friends done it is they've um they have a Facebook group with like their name and then um it's niche specific. And then um I'm sure you've seen the marketer who like sells like group track and stuff is who I'd refer you to. Um look up group track and then I'll look for the text and I'll send them to you. Um, Cause they still market to me all the time to where they're like, yeah, we may help our clients make millions of dollars. They're just essentially they help you grow and scale a Facebook group to where I think like Alex Youngblood, he really underutilizes his, I think he has mm. like wholesaling houses full time and it's huge. Yeah. Bro, if anything, you should be making fucking $20 million a, a year off that bitch. Um, <laughs> I mean, just the amount of eyeballs are insane to where this will be my fucking last rant on this subject. My uh, one of my really close friends, and he's a business partner, and a couple different things with me. He um, has the largest Facebook group in the world for Airbnb. Wow! He just released a forty-nine dollar offer, and he doesn't get a ton of reach in it. But month one, he made twenty forty-nine dollars, and he made twenty grand. Wow, that's crazy! Right. right, that's crazy, and that goes into like commanding the eyeballs and everything else. The, un the only hard part, and you know this, Facebook will throttle you. I think if you could find a way to get people over to like a discord group and keep it active, like that's what was so cool about crypto is that everybody in like a discord and then it's like nonstop to where Facebook throttles you super heavy. How does Facebook uh, throttle you? Is it like certain my, percentage so, of the post or? Nobody knows. My, so my friend in a Facebook group, you can go, um, and his name's Kyle Stanley, shout out Kyle, man. You um, can hit at and tag everyone in that group and send them a notification. He can't do that. There's a hundred and wow. there's like 150,000 people in there. I don't know. He doesn't know why. No one will help him. And like his posts barely reach people, right? But luckily he like pulled a bunch of people's emails when he was growing it. Right. But I mean, I'm, you know, this Facebook groups, email. Um, I like Pace because like the community he's built and it all kind of, it all kind of plays a role like it, into the machine to where I'd say use the Pace model. Pace has the sub two Facebook group. Pace has his email list. Pace has his coaching program of upsells. Pace has deal flow. And his even though his coaching program is forever, he wants to do deals with all the students and he can raise money from the students. He can go buy whatever deal he wants. His deal flow is fucking nuts, just like Hormozy. But Alex Hormozy can ask for the fucking world, invest no money. And people are like, yeah, bro, you're Hormozy. I got you. You're the Messiah. Of course I want you in my company for 60% equity, <laughs> right? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's worse than fucking venture funds. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I've, I've always been trying to figure out if it's like a shiny object, the no piece of it, but yeah. Okay. No, I think if you, I mean, bro, even uh, bro, Alex talks about this with Grant, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And Grant is probably the best. I don't know if there's a better marketer and a lot of it is done through social. Like there is not a better marketer in the entrepreneurship space than Grant. You got like Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, dude, I'm in. The thing is, uh, you know, I, I think it was when Alex like first like 
piqued our interest in it was when we were like, okay, maybe we should take it seriously kind of thing. Um, Cause before that, we were just speaks, like, bro. you need to listen. Yeah. 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 Attention is the new oil. That's for sure. It is. Yeah. It's hard, but I think it's worth it because it'll be, I need to collect more emails and like get people in like my ecosystem. Ecosystem is the next thing, but it all social is that top funnel. Interesting. Okay. Huh. Would you, well, I don't want to, I don't want to keep it too long. I got, I got like unlimited questions, but um, I guess how, when I last checked on Instagram, you were like 40, thousand forty five thousand something followers something like that I, what's the platform you focus on the most is it instagram or instagram i'm on the most okay. um i put out like facebook lives tiktok will give you the most explosive growth it's just a pain in the ass to do for me okay so you got instagram at forty five thousand. how long did it take you to go from zero to 45 and like what did that growth cycle look like was it really slow at first and then it picked up or was it like bro 100 percent transparency i bought followers um okay. i wouldn't suggest to do it i think you can get crazy growth through tiktok Okay. And the reason I bought the followers is because I needed the swipe up at 10,000. And I knew a swipe guy. Up. Yeah, What's the so swipe could, up? You could like swipe up. Like I could be like swipe up to buy this product. And so I was like, all right, I'll do that. And I'll like send people to Call Magician's website. Okay. Right. And that's all I wanted. And then I donated to like one of the biggest like growth dudes in the country's charity. He's like, all right, hey, bro, I'll give you like another like 20,000 followers. So like, sweet. <laughs> How many of them are real then? I guess roughly. I don't even know now. Probably half. Interesting okay um but so the one thing it did give me is like people see it and they're like oh wow this is like he's he's legit as stupid as that is bro i will go to a conference but yeah follow me on instagram they're like oh wow you got forty thousand followers so the truth about social everybody bought their followers and everybody pays for engagement and everybody paid for their blue check it's just like are you willing to pay the money to play the game interesting okay I would tell you start um, start organic, and you can look at my friend Jason Pritchard. Jason probably has like five thousand followers, and bro, I swear to God, he has five thousand people who would sleep with him today. Like they yeah. are bought in to everything he's selling, everything he's doing. Would you rather have five thousand who are super dedicated, or would you rather have like a hundred thousand who check in once a year, kind of thing? I'd take the medium. The I'd medium. take a fifty at the medium. Okay. Well, I don't know. 5,000 who are dedicated, who are like, like dedicated. That's yeah. powerful, bro. Like f- imagine if you had 5,000 clients. That, yeah. That'd be you know what I'm people. saying? Like 5,000 yeah. clients, like any company that has 5,000 clients is a, I mean, you're, but you're a hundred million dollar company, like through upsells, affiliates and everything else. Like anyone who can get a 5,000 people to pay them a month, like you're doing something. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Dude, my weekend's going to be busy now, man. I got to get into this. Dang. <laughs> uh, back me in. All right, that's but fun. for sure, thank, thank you so much for coming on, bro. I got to go hop out and I got to go to this meetup. Um, for sure. Again, where can people find you? You need to get on IG. What's the IG name you're going to create so people can follow you? Uh, it's at Andrew Kalaji. I got like 300 followers. I posted one picture thus far. So this weekend, I'm going to be posting something. Um, you find me on Facebook too, Andy Cloudy, and then smtri.com, properties.com, and then leadvine.com are the three companies if you're interested. And if you're not, that's cool. It's best to be on Facebook. Let's talk about data, real estate, SEO, whatever you want to talk about. So, oh, yeah, bro. Thank and you, man. Connect, thank you, man, for Let's me connect on. next week. Um, if you need any help on brand stuff, just reach out. To I me, definitely bro. do. I will be. All right. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, bro. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Have a good one.